So I'm going to flip this a little bit. Uh, Laurie and Peter gave great data, very data heavy. And David and I have talked about this whole concept of trying to understand hereditary testing and how we can make this more applicable really to the practicing urologist. So as I've been putting this talk together, I've decided to talk about genetic testing and prostate cancer and really a concept of recoupling molecular biology and clinical expertise. Uh, these are my disclosures. So some basic definitions, and I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run through these slides very quickly like Laurie did. So, you know, genetics is truly just the evaluation of a patient's inherited genetic makeup. And th those are the classic Gregor Mendel experiments back years ago. The genome is really an organism's complete DNA sense, and genomics is really the, con this is what's really important. It's the complex analysis of the patient's genes, their interaction with other genes, as well as the environment that they may result in unregulated cell growth. Really so, how this all started, this was the seminal paper that Colin Pritchard and the Stand Up to Cancer team published in 2016 in the New England Journal, that basically the bottom line here is that germline mutations were inherited in about 12% of patients in, with metastatic disease versus what they thought was about 4.6% in basically standard data sets for people with localized disease. So this sort of got our attention relative to the concept of looking at whether or not we should be testing for germline mutations. This is data uh, that Emmanuel Anton Rock has shared with me, uh, uh, basically, again, looking at, D at DNA repair defects in metastatic CRPC, looking at all DNA repair effects, and then specifically looking at mutations in homologous recombination. It's about 21.3%. Mismatch repair defects, again, a little bit of a different play. Uh, you see about a, a little bit of a lower percentage, but yet still in play here for metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Carroll alluded to this slide, uh, alluded to this data earlier, and that men with prostatic ductal carcinoma overall close to 50% had DNA repair gene mutations, 14% were mismatch repair, and 31 were homologous recombination. We've heard about this data for now for the past five years, the implications of BRCA1-2 mutations in prostate cancer. And the reality is what we're really talking about here are DNA damage repair genes. So when we look at this, how you need to start thinking about this, what we're talking about are, are mutations in DNA damage repair. That's what this boils down to. So you have you have genes that are involved in double-stranded breaks, which is really the homologous recombination pathway, and those are the Fanconi genes, BRCA1, 2, ATM, PALB, RAT50, number of these we've identified as being very, very germane in prostate cancer. And then you have mismatch repair, which are involved in single-stranded breaks. So the mismatch repair are your classic MSH2, MSH6, MLH1, PMS2. Those are also the genes that are important for looking at to determine microsatellite instability, which is actually very, this is standard of care for looking at patients when they get colectomies for their colon cancers. They do immunohistochemical staining on these tumors for protein expression, and that's actually how the colorectal people determine uh, basically microsatellite instability. It's really done through IHC, although we're now actually seeing a transition into next generation sequencing. But the bottom line is that this was a quote that I found, in every case of every malady, there are two sets of factors at work in the formation of the morbid picture, namely internal or, con con or constitutional factors inherent in the sufferer and usually inherited in his forebearers and external ones which fired the train. This was in 1931. Basically what he's talking about is that we have germline mutations which are inherited and you have somatic mutations which are uh, acquired. I actually stole this from Colin Pritchard at UW and basically this is where we stand right now. So you're saying, well, you know, what, what exactly does this depict? So essentially the kid on the tricycle in the bottom right is he wants to get just down the block to see his friends and he's happy to ride a tricycle. However, we're gonna pull him down with a 747. So what's actually what we're experiencing now is our understanding that the technology that we can actually use to interrogate mutations is next generation sequencing. 
but our understanding of the mutations and how they affect disease is the kid on the tricycle. We are far outpacing our clinical expertise. So this is the, this is the challenge that we have. So I basically, uh, again, I want to recouple the understanding and give all of you sort of a baseline of how to think about these mutations in a more organized fashion. So it's really recoupling molecular biology, stuff that we've all learned back in high school biology, DNA, RNA, central dogma, and then how to essentially associate that with clinical expertise. And really what this is, again, so, this is, the, this is the normal karyotype, we all know this. So if you have a chromosome, so in case you forgot, you have a P arm, a short arm, a petite arm, and you have the Q arm, and you have a centromere. And then you have alleles, and you have a loci, a locus. So the locus is the position of the gene, and the allele is what you get from each one of your parents. So in next generation sequencing, these are all numbered. So when you look at BRCA1, so when you see what BRCA1 is, it's chromosome 17, it's on the Q arm of locus 21. BRCA2 is on chromosome 13, it's on the Q arm of 23. So that's what the nomenclature, when you see that, that's what that means. It's the naming of the location, it's based upon the chromosome, it's based upon the band, and it's based upon whether it's on the short arm or on the long arm. Again, this is all basic biology. So this is the central dogma. You have DNA, which then goes to transcription, which goes to mRNA, which then goes to translation into the cytoplasm and it results in a protein. You have genetic codes, and I think this is where it gets a little bit confusing because we're going to lead now and to start really talking about mutations, and we all know this. So the genetic code, really, for DNA, it's, it's basically nucleotides, and it's, it's, the, it's the constant pairing of purines and pyrimidines. And in, in RNA, instead of a thymine, you have a uracil. So one codon, basically three amino acids, encodes for various proteins, or excuse me, various amino acids. So this is, this is central to the whole concept of translation. And remember, you have multiple sequences that can result actually in the same amino acid. But in translation, you always, when translation starts, you always have a definitive start code and you have definitive stop codes. You have stop codons. That's very important to recognize because this is why, remember, you start off with the gene, which is kind of what we're concentrating on when you hear everybody talk about this, but ultimately it has to result in a protein. And it's the non-expression or loss of function of that protein which is really causing the problem. And once you get a stop codon, depending upon what the mutation is, that's where the issues are, that's where it all arises. So let's take BRCA2. I think Larry talked a little bit about, you know, so you, you've heard Lenny Gamella talk about brca -ness. So BRCA2, let's, let's look at BRCA2. Its position, it's on the 13 chromosome on the Q arm, band 23. BRCA2 is a huge protein. It's 3,000 plus amino acids. So let's work backwards. If it's 3,000 plus amino acids, each amino acid has three base pairs, which basically results in over 9,000 base pairs. Each base pair is, is made up of two nucleotides. So in BRCA2, the gene, you have over 20,000 nucleotides in the BRCA2 gene. 20,000. You can have a point, you can have a change in one nucleotide, and that is a point mutation. So the question is, does that one little change result in a non-functional or an alteration in protein expression? So when you start looking at mutations, you can have silent mutations. So that what that means is that here, this is the normal sequence. Here you have a point mutation, so you have a uracil which still results, because of the, the way the coding works, it still results, even though it's a mutation, it still results in a glycine. So there is actually no change in that protein. So that is a silent mutation. Then you have a missense mutation. And the question is, so in this case, again, what's normally a glycine, you have an adenine here, and it results in a serine. And the question is, does that change in that amino acid 
result in a change in the function of that protein. <clears throat> you can have a frame shift. Let me see if I skip something here. So then you have a missense. Uh, okay, we did that. And then you can have frame shifts. So you have insertions and deletions of nucleotides, and that's where the, the reading of during translation can change. So this is, these, are all, these are all basic mutations. You have a nonsense mutation. And remember, what I said is that you have specific stop codons that will truncate that protein. So if you have a stop, if you have a mutation that results in a lysine that then goes to a stop codon, that will truncate the, that translation to a protein. And more than likely, that will be a pathogenic variant. So these are the things that, so you have normal, missense, nonsense, frame shifts, insertions, or deletions. <clears throat> So you've seen these reports. This is an in vitae report. So look at this. So this is a, an identified pathogenic mutation, and you see all these numbers, right? So what, is, what does all that mean? What do those numbers mean? So they're a standard nomenclature. So these are the amino acids. And again, there's 20 of them, but they can be basically coded by multiple different sequences. And this is the universal nomenclature. So if you see a C, that means they're actually interpreting coding DNA. For a P, it's protein. For a G, it's genomic DNA. R is for RNA. M is for mitochondrial DNA. So specific codes, so you have intronic stop codons, deletions, duplications. So when you look at this mutation, which they've defined as pathogenic, you're looking at coding DNA at position 4631. You have a deletion of an adenine, which then results in a protein where an asparagine has been insert, is now result at position 1544, excuse, no, excuse me, instead of an asparagine, you've now gone to a threonine, which results in a stop codon, and that's a pathogenic mutation. That's what that means. It's the standard nomenclature. But again, this is all related to, again, the central dogma of transcription and translation. So when you get reports back, and this is the challenge that we all have, the, the classification, we think that every, there are a number of mutations. So you have pathogenic mutations, likely pathogenic, VUS, which we hear a lot about, likely benign and benign. Those can all come back. We are concerned about the pathogenics, but the problem is all these will change with time. The mutation won't change, but as we test more, the clinical significance of these mutations will change. So we've seen this. These are the genes that are associated uh, with prostate cancer. Many of us know that. But we also have to look at the type of gene. We have high penetrance genes, which are BRCA1, BRCA2, STK11, P10. You have moderate risk alleles, and you have low penetrance. You're gonna, and so we know that all tumors are a multi-step process. I think Wendy made a comment yesterday. We have prostate cancer patients and or patients with high environmental exposure that get cancer at an early age. Well, this is the Knudsen two-hit hypothesis. So basically, what you're talking about is a loss of expression. You, you inherit that early risk. So that's present in every cell. That's the hereditary. It's when you get the second hit, usually due to an environmental factor, that's what causes the unregulated cell growth. So in the hereditary model, you have an inherited hit, but with your, with your interchange, with your environmental exposure, you get the second hit, and that's what causes the ultimate dysregulation and unregulated cell growth. That's why it happens at an earlier age. So these are tumor suppressor genes. Basically, in, it's, it's really for tumor suppressor genes, you really need that second hit. You're going to hear about SNPs. I haven't, there's a lot of people in the room. Dr. Carroll mentioned it. Brian's here. Kareem's here. We talk about SNPs. It's important to under, understand SNPs. These are single nucleotide polymorphisms that, by definition, are present in 1% of the population. And you're going to hear a lot about polygenic risk scores. But here's how you have to look at this. So if you have a rare pathogenic mutation, that is a, that is a lack of expression of, of, the, of a light bulb. And the question is, with multiple SNPs, does that result in the same risk? And what's the importance of this? So this is data that uh, Phil Febo shared with me from Illumina. So we think that as urologists, you know, we're not doing a good job. We need to do a better job. But our medical oncology colleagues aren't necessarily doing much better. 
So these are 100 U.S. metastatic cancer patients. 60%, even in the medical oncology world, are not undergoing molecular testing. But when you look at that, this is non-small cell cancer, this is non-small cell lung cancer. If you do targeted therapy, if you do molecular testing, your overall survival is much better. So that is the importance of undertaking this. This is the whole promise of precision medicine. So a lot of slides, conclusions you can read. Anybody that wants copies of these, happy to share. Thank you.